I shall start there. Let's cross, shall we, live over to Israel. Our reporter there, Charlie Peters. Uh, can you bring us up to speed, Charlie, with the goings on? Well, Joe Biden arrived today in probably the most tense atmosphere the Middle East has been in for several years. After last night's explosion at a Christian hospital in Gaza City, where Hamas claimed that an Israeli airstrike had killed 500 people. However, this morning, the Israeli Defense Force set out their intelligence on the situation and said that the Palestinian Islamic Jihad were to blame. They released both intelligence from imagery and also signals intelligence and footage from the ground to show that the devastation in their mind was not as close as what Hamas had claimed last night. The 500 dead death toll has yet to be verified. But as President Joe Biden landed in Tel Aviv, he had two missions. One, to reaffirm his support to Israel during this time of war, the worst violence the country has seen for 50 years, but also to temper that support for the destruction of Hamas with a humanitarian diplomacy. This afternoon, he achieved that mission in one part at least with the opening of humanitarian convoys from the Egyptian side into the Gaza Strip. This was a key mission for US Secretary of State Antony Blinken, who demanded it, demanded it last week but could not achieve it. There is now a humanitarian safe zone on the coast in the southwest of the Strip, and we expect those first convoys will be allowed to cross the Rafa crossing into Gaza. So that's a significant development for Biden's Washington diplomacy in the region. But there are also failures. After last night's reported Israeli airstrikes since challenged by U.S. intelligence and the Israeli side, the whole of the Arab region has reacted very negatively to both the Israelis and the Americans. There have been widespread protests across the region here. In Amman, in Jordan, people were chanting, we stand by Hamas. And in Ramallah, in the West Bank, we also saw a significant uprising as tensions flared. In the north of the country, there was also a return of the skirmishes and violence that we've seen over the last week with missiles fired in from southern Lebanon by Lebanese Hezbollah and the IDF responding with artillery and gunfire of their own. So President Biden left with the message that what he wants above all else is peace. But as he left Tel Aviv tonight, rockets flew in from the Gaza Strip over us, intercepted by Iron Dome. It appears that that demand and that expectation for Joe Biden will have to wait for some time. Charlie Peters, thank you for bringing us up to speed. Uh, and as always, do stay safe. Now, uh, there have been rumours that, of course, we've had Biden there today. Uh, there's been rumours now that Rishi Sunak is planning and preparing uh, for a visit over to Israel in the coming days, which has made me uh, ask tonight a simple question to all your ladies and gents at home and, of course, to my panel. What should Britain's role be in all of this? So I would like your thoughts on that. But for now, Richard, what's your thoughts? I think diplomacy. I don't think we should be sending military equipment, but I think we can use whatever extra diplomatic expertise and persuasion that we can over and above the Americans. And there may be just different ways that we can try and, uh, in a sense, just reduce the extreme tension, the extreme difficulties we all know that propaganda is such a key part of these wars. It's very easy to jump in on either side or the other with the various claims. We have to be very careful about that. Um, I suspect, actually, just from a practical point of view, for the Israelis, just dealing with these high-profile visits, the president of the US, possibly the prime minister uh, of the UK, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, I mean, it must be a nightmare just dealing with all these. Well, actually, you're, you're, you're in the middle of a war. You're trying to defend your own people. Yeah, and I think it was um, Olaf Scholz as well when he was preparing to leave on Tuesday. They had to evacuate his plane because of uh, rocket, rocket attacks and stuff. Let me just ask you this, though, because apparently we have already directed uh, military assets over uh, to the eastern uh, Mediterranean. So just to give you um, some idea, the military package uh, includes PA aircraft surveillance uh, assets, two Royal Navy ships, three Merlin helicopters, and apparently a company of Royal Marines. Uh, the suggestion here is that this is all about offering deterrence and yeah, assurance. But, that, but that's a difference to actually providing military equipment on the ground, which is, of course, what we've done with Ukraine. I mean, that list sounds back, like pretty much the whole of our that? Royal Navy. But do you back that? I mean, let me bring you in as well, Atul. What, what do you think about our position and, and our response and what we're doing? I think it's important that Rishi Sunak goes to Israel, um, and I disagree with Richard on uh, for three reasons. One, to show that the members of the Jewish community in Britain 
this matters. And it's not just a transactional political thing. It's important enough for the leader of the country to go because it's a, such a trauma for the Jewish community in this country. Two, there are Britons who are kidnapped and in Gaza. Mm -hmm. And to make to whatever we can do to push this up the agenda, the freedom for those Britons, and incidentally, maybe some of those assets being moved uh, into the eastern Mediterranean, it's around uh, exit routes for yeah, all kind of preparations for if we can get, get um, the captives, the British captives out. But I think number three, to show the Israelis that we stand with them, they have the right to act, but also to be honest friends, which is if you're going to go into Gaza, and they are, you've got to have a plan to get out. And that point needs to be made. But who, do you think there is a plan as to, because it, it's all well and good saying, OK, we're going to respond, understandably, by the way, who wouldn't want to respond to what happened um, on October the 7th? I think, you know, no questions there. But do you think that people are thinking through the long term aim? Because, yes, it's one thing kind of going, right, OK, we stand in solidarity, we, uh, we're friends or whatever your terminology was. But what is the long term plan here? Because there are people now, they will be getting radicalised all over the place. Social media, if you ask me, is a, a very dangerous tool at the moment because within minutes of things happening, like you saw that hospital attack last mm -hmm. night, within literally, well not even minutes, within seconds of these things um, happening, you've got so many messages being uh, splashed out to people. This was the Aurelis. People are then getting infuriated, responding. Charlie was just saying then you've seen uh, protests all over places in the Middle East. Tensions are really getting inflamed now. So do you think enough thought uh, and enough joined up thinking perhaps is going into the longer term I think uh, that is one of the roles that Britain can play. That's the point. Rishi Sunak goes over there face to face with Benjamin Netanyahu because Joe Biden would have said the same thing. There's people in Benjamin Netanyahu's cabinet who will make that point. Anger, blind anger can't rule because they'll get themselves into a situation they can't get out of. It'll be a, it'll be a sort of urban Vietnam. And it's, it's focusing actually on beyond the short term. It's the medium term. How do you reduce the potential for... Uh, escalation in Lebanon and in other neighbouring countries, uh, tensions around the embassies, these things can bubble over very quickly into mm. very dangerous situations. That's the diplomacy that I was referring to that maybe some of our British experts may be able to add to hmm. the whole equation. That's, uh, that, that's absolutely... And do you have kind of um, trust that actually um, uh, that will happen? Do you have your faith and your trust in our leadership that actually they can help stabilise things? Because the, the list that I just referenced there and I'm saying to you, um, Grant Shapps is saying about things like the word deterrent is really important. Is that a deterrent? Lining up those helicopters and all the rest of it and the, the Marines, is that a deterrent? Well, it's, look, it's something, but you have, to, you have to try with the diplomacy. It's incredibly difficult. So many great people have tried for so many, frankly, mm -hmm. decades. So this is not easy, but this is potentially, this is because it's for Israel, it's bigger than 9-11. Yeah, Maybe this is that sort of seismic existential moment where people actually have to say, enough is enough. Hamas have to be removed from Gaza once and for all and come up with a... A, a different, bolder, more radical solution, because otherwise this just goes on mm. and on. And frankly, everybody suffers and many, many more people sadly die. Yeah. And um, uh, Homs Yusuf uh, as well, he's been speaking out over the last day or so. Let's listen. Of course, you'll be familiar with the fact that his uh, family are, are currently in Gaza. Calling on the UK government to take two urgent steps. Firstly, they should immediately begin work on the creation of a refugee resettlement scheme for those in Gaza who want to and, of course, are able to leave. And when they do so, Scotland is willing to be the first country in the UK to offer safety and sanctuary to those who are... And he also went on to say that um, basically the hospitals in Scotland would be ready um, to provide treatment to those people that have been injured um, in Gaza, etc. I mean, do you agree with what he's saying? I think as part of a broader package, yes. It's not, it's not, it doesn't make a lot of sense just sort of chucking out an offer when Egypt's closed the border, when Jordan's closed the border, when the US is doing one thing, the European Union's doing another, we're doing another. Where there is a broader diplomatic consensus across Britain, Europe, the US, Egypt and, in the, kind of, and the surrounding countries, we need to be part of that because it's part of our standing in the world and we have historic ties in the region. We as, and as I said, we have Britons who are currently kidnapped in Gaza. Now, what the shape that takes, I'm not too sure. But if that means taking 
some refugees or it means providing specialist medical help, if it means providing some form of uh, ex, you know, technical uh, military help in some dimension, fine. But it has to be as part of a coordinated plan rather than just sort of individual kind of one off. That office. takes time though, doesn't it? You know, if you're trapped in Gaza or wherever and you want to um, get out, what, um, or even if you're trapped in Israel or whatever, you know, you're not going to be sitting there thinking, oh, I've got the luxury of time for the international community to sort themselves out and come up with a plan. You've got no, bombs raining down on your head. Y- you have, but we have to provide the expertise and the help in situ uh, in the territory. And, and I think that's what we've got to focus on. It's very easy for Humza Yousaf to make that but actually, I don't think that the, that's what the British people want. I think the British people want this sorted out in situ. Use our diplomacy, use a deterrence if we can. But, you know, this is, uh, otherwise this goes on and on. And we've got our own huge problems, as you know, Michelle, that we're going to be talking about later with immigration. Well, we're literally just about to go... Awful. So, you know, we've got massive issues ourselves. You've just teed that up nicely for me because we are indeed um, about to come on to that very topic. So I will throw that open to you at home. What did you think to what um, SNP leader was saying then about opening essentially uh, routes the way that I guess we did in Ukraine? Would that be something that you would get behind? Um, let me know your thoughts on that. We're talking about people, uh, Brits that have died as well, of course, just to remind us all. Uh, seven Brits, uh, very sadly, have been confirmed to be, di- be dead, um, uh, killed in this uh, atrocity. And also as well, I think there's nine hostages that we currently know of.